March Madness this year has truly been special and maybe one of the best tournaments we've seen in a while. We not only saw a 15 seed in Princeton upset Arizona, but we also watched as Fairleigh Dickinson upset in Purdue the following day bursting everyone's bracket. What can I say? Don't mess with low seeded Jersey teams in March. But the best story of the tournament may just be the fact that Florida Atlantic has made their first Final Four in school history. But how did they do it? Let's take a look. Coming into the 2023 college basketball season, the Florida Atlantic Owls were ranked 5th in the Conference USA preseason polls behind teams like Middle Tennessee State. As the season wore on, this team became battle tested whether it was scrimmaging against the future Division II national champions in Nova Southeastern, who in their own right is one of the hardest playing and best pressing teams in the nation, or traveling to Gainesville to beat Florida on the road on their way to a 31-3 record. They even found themselves ranked at one point and finished the season as one of the only teams in Ken Palm's top 30 offenses and top 30 defensive rankings. But let's go back in time for a second. Florida Atlantic University opened its doors in 1964 and first began playing basketball in 1988. They played their first game against Division II Palm Beach Atlantic University, a game they won 111-62. Although they would start their basketball program off with a strong first victory, that sweet feeling would not last very long. They finished their inaugural season going 9-19, losing 12 straight games at one point. They were led by head coach Lonnie Williams, who was known as a program builder at the time, but he would leave for the UC Davis job after the season. They replaced Williams with Penn State assistant coach Tim Loomis, who led Florida Atlantic to a 21-7 record and back-to-back 15-3 records. Loomis set a bar for the Owls they have sort of struggled to get back to. He was able to schedule games against Miami, which they would lose but showed the growth of the program. The fact a Power 5 team like the Hurricanes wanted to play them meant this program might be a special one. The Owls would fall off a cliff the next two seasons going 3-24 and 3-25 as they made their transition to Division 1. During this time period, members of these teams were true pioneers and super fundraisers for the athletic department as they hit the road to play teams like Florida State, number 10 Georgetown and Iowa State while taking large paydays and suffering losses to higher ranked opponents. In the 1993-1994 season, they became the first Atlantic Sun team to ever beat an ACC team when they went on the road to upset NC State. They joined the Atlantic Sun when they first made the jump to Division I, mainly for their baseball team. The team bounced back to a 9-19 record in Loomis' last season, and Kevin Billerman would take over as head coach. They had their first winning season at the Division I level in 1996-1997, where they recorded one of the biggest upsets in program history when they beat number 11 Oklahoma State in Stillwater, ending Oklahoma State's 80-game home non-conference win streak. It was Florida Atlantic's only win over a Big 12 program prior to the Owls' win over Kansas State in the Elite Eight this past weekend, but we will get there. That would be the only winning season under Billerman, who finished his four years in Boca Raton with a 36-71 record. Sidney Green took over as head coach in 1999, leading Florida Atlantic to one of their worst seasons in program history, going 2-28, losing 25 consecutive games at one point in 1999, but also brought the program to new heights, leading the Owls to their first ASUN Conference Tournament Championship and their first NCAA Tournament appearance with a number 15 seed, losing to Alabama 86-78. Green never managed to recapture the magic of 2002, however, and the Owls finally moved on in 2005 after three consecutive losing seasons. Matt Darty became the first coach to ever leave Florida Atlantic with a winning record when he went 15-13 in his lone season with the Owls, in which they started an ESPN2 reality show. Due to their success as a football program, the Owls moved to the Sun Belt Conference and hired Rex Walters, who led the Owls to a winning record in 2007, marking it as the first time in program history the Owls had back-to-back -back winning seasons at the Division I level. Walters' stay proved fleeting for the Owls, however, as San Francisco University scooped up the young coaching talent to succeed legendary head coach Eddie Sutton in 2008. Although Mike Jarvis had helped lead St. John's to the Elite Eight in 1999, he was unable to find the same type of success as the Owls head coach. They went 21-11 in 2011, but lost in the first round of the NIT, and that was all the success they found during the time. Michael Curry was hired as Jarvis' replacement, but after four seasons and a 39-84 record, he was fired, leading to the hire of current basketball coach Dusty May. Dusty May had served as a student manager at Indiana under Bob Knight from 1996 to 2000, and after graduating, he had a video and administrative roles with USC and the Hoosiers. 
He had grown up about 20 minutes from Bloomington, Indiana, and loved the Indiana Hoosiers basketball program as a kid. It was life or death for him, as he stayed up past his bedtime watching the Hoosiers when they played. He knew he wanted to be a high school coach, and he'd take notes during practice and film sessions. He was so locked in on his note-taking one day that when a loose ball rolled to his feet and Knight asked him to get it, he didn't hear him. Dusty, Knight screamed, if I see another note card out, you're fired. He received his first assistant coaching job at Eastern Michigan before making stops at Murray State and UAB, where he served under former Indiana head coach Mike Davis. He then served as an assistant under Kerry Rupp and Mike White at Louisiana Tech and followed White to Florida, where he coached from 2015 to 2018. Florida Atlantic Athletic Director Brian White tapped into his personal knowledge of the energetic, relentless coach who he had worked with at Louisiana Tech and the conversation he had with his brother, then Florida coach Mike White, to make the most significant hire in program history. May signed with the Owls before ever seeing Florida Atlantic's basketball facilities and later admitted he thought he had committed career suicide by taking the job. However, May was praised for accepting the challenge of building Florida Atlantic into a team that would compete on the national stage. Up to this point, Florida Atlantic had always tried to hire the biggest name they could, but as we talked about so far in this video, that led to very little success. While the Owls' other programs found moderate success during this time period, the basketball team felt like it was falling behind, so Florida Atlantic decided to go in a different direction this time around. May was addicted to basketball, and looking back, with hindsight being 2020, he almost seemed destined to be a great head coach. He rarely slept while recruiting at Louisiana Tech. He immediately turned a morbid program into a winner, going 17 and 16 in his first year. White told The Athletic, He doesn't act like he's got it all figured out. Dusty will spend an hour with anyone just talking hoops. Hell, it could be a junior high school coach. Dusty's going to tell him everything he does, and then he's going to say, What are you doing? He's going to try to learn from him. In his third season as a head coach at Florida Atlantic, he fell in love with Doug Lamov's book, The Coach's Guide to Teaching and listened to his podcast with Chris Oliver back in 2020. Lamov told Oliver that great coaches are really careful about not rushing to chastising a player when they make a mistake. Instead, a great coach pauses and says, let's look at what happened. When May implemented that style into his coaching, he immediately saw it pay off. Just go and watch the final few minutes of the Florida Atlantic UTEP game from the 2020 conference tournament. They never have the same routine when it comes to practice with May, with him telling the athletic, it's bouncing around because the sole premise is as soon as you learn something, you immediately forget it. So how do we get our guys to retain the information where it's in their long-term memory as opposed to working memory? He wants players to make the mistakes in practice so it doesn't happen in the games. Most of the team this year has been together for three seasons and there was a change last season around Christmas time. The players were connecting and were on the same page. Elijah Martin changed how he played the game and his mindset when it came to the game after the 2021 season when May told him he needed to play harder on defense if he wanted to get more playing time. And that led to him being one of the toughest defenders on the team and leading the team in scoring for the 2022 season. John L. Davis was one of the most talented players on the team, but a change in his work ethic after May called him out transformed him into a brand new player. Everything has come together perfectly for the Owls as there isn't just one guy you need to worry about. May runs a 9-player rotation this year with 7 players averaging between 20 and 25 minutes per game and the other 2 averaging 16 minutes per game. They added UConn guard Jalen Gaffney, who has led the Owls in assists. 5 guys average better than 9.2 points per game, 7 average at least 1.4 assists per game, and 7 make at least 1 3-pointer per game. Vladislav Golden has been special down low at 7-1, but the Owls are small. Rosado at 6'7 is the only other rotational player taller than 6'4. But all of those guards are nightmares to deal with offensively. Defenses can never just key in on one or two guys. There are always four guards on the floor who could dribble, pass, and shoot, and they're quick. Anyone can be a screener too. The Owls rank 330th in average height per Ken Palm, but they're 25th in defensive rebounding rate. This is because they play a tight scheme and their players play with great effort. The Owls also limit threes and have the 14th best two-point defense in college basketball. They are opposing coaches' nightmare, as for 40 minutes they are relentless on both ends of the floor. The Owls won both the regular season and Conference USA tournament titles and looked primed to have a strong run in March. ESPN's Jeff Barzello writes, On Selection Sunday, one of the biggest talking points was how underseeded Florida Atlantic seemed. The Owls entered the NCAA tournament with a 31-3 record and a top 30 ranking in most metrics. Yet they were given a 9 seed due to their lack of high quality wins. But they went out, silenced the doubters, and backed up their supporters. 
It took a last second shot for Nick Boyd to beat Memphis in the first round before facing 16 seed Fairleigh Dickinson in the second round. Fairleigh Dickinson looked poised for a second straight stunner, but Florida Atlantic pulled away late. Against the physical and defensive minded Tennessee team in the Sweet 16, Florida Atlantic was able to impose its will more than most teams had all season. And then the Owls took down NCAA tournament star Mar Marquise Knoll in Kansas State in the Elite Eight. While many may feel like Florida Atlantic is on an insane run, when you take a deep dive, none of it is actually that surprising, and a lot of it has to do with Coach May getting the best out of his players. Who knows if the Owls can win their first national title in program history. It's March Madness, for gosh darn sakes, you never know what's going to happen. What I do know though is, the Owls will be playing extremely hard on Saturday against San Diego State, and they won't be easy to beat. I will also not be surprised if this program is here to stay as long as May is their head coach. What do you think? Who will win the NCAA tournament on Monday? Let me know in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out one of my other videos right here. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more college football content. Thank you so much for watching. I could not be more thankful for y'all. You guys make this all possible for me. And as always, remember to embrace the grind.